Uh, so, um, yeah, um, so the topic of this talk will be cellular automata, classical cellular automata, the relation to classical statistical mechanics. So nothing quantum here. I'm sorry for those who are interested essentially in quantum stuff. Even though some people would like to take on this, uh, these models uh, to consider also quantum operator spreadings and stuff. So, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, this could be interpreted also in terms of quantum models, but uh, I will not do that in my talk. So, uh, so uh, let me tell you about my motivation, why I basically we got excited about this type of models. Um, uh, well, first of all, I mean, question is, uh, uh, well, the main sort of, uh, uh, the main point I would like to stress is that maybe for such models it's possible to find time-dependent cell matrix ansatz which describes solutions of, let's say, observables, time-dependent observables, despite the uh, uh, stro strongly interacting nature of the model. Um, <coughs> essentially, what I believe is that this type of models, uh, and that will be just one model, essentially. Not so. I mean, I believe that there could be some generalizations, but so far we have just one model I will discuss I in detail. Uh, but the question is, I mean, can we say every, essentially everything, uh, uh, you know, can we have a model about which we can basically say, say everything, right? I mean, so we make all the possible connections that we like to make, you know, to, to derive, let's say, macroscopic law for max, ma microscopic equations of motion and stuff like this. Uh, so, for example, and we really want to have a model which has a generic physical, trans let's say, transport properties, yeah. So I try to advocate now, there is a simple model, it's like a harmonic oscillator of interacting models. Uh, which you can solve and which has uh, sort of the generic physics and you know you can ask all your favorite questions about statistical physics and maybe in this model you can find an answer. Of course you might see the, say there are other models like this but this model has a one certain uh, feature which maybe not other models have which is that it is purely deterministic. There is no noise, no 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 no, no stochasticity in the mo built in the model. So stochasticity is should be emerging and in this model you can s convince you yourself how it emerges right. So <coughs> So that will be a short outline or menu of my talk. It's essentially, first is the motivation and the outline of the model. And the model we took from this old paper by Alexander Bobenko and company from 93. They classified all possible uh, reversible cellular automata. It's similar to Wolfram's classification, but this one is for reversible automata. Again, there are 256 automata. And the rule number 54 is the only one which is really interesting. And there are other few which are equivalent to that. And that corresponds to interacting particles. So really to, to particle-like excitations which propagate and interact. And then uh, with Carlos Mejia, we, were being, we have been thinking, we started thinking about this, and we discussed, uh, started discussing this uh, at the end of 2015 when he visited me. And uh, we, we basically came, out with the, came, up, came, out, came up with the idea how to make uh, uh, exact solutions based on this model uh, connected to stochastic boundaries. So you think of your, I mean, I will discuss this in more detail, so I don't want to, to spend too much time on introdu introducing all these questions, but you know, there will be these uh, stochastic boundaries which you can connect to this model and still they are compatible with, exact, with let's say, integrability of the model. And uh, with Berislav Butra, who is my former PhD student, we have been able then to diagonalize the Lubilian completely, well, completely. I mean, we've been able to find uh, not only the, the steady state of the boundary-driven problem, but also the some of the, let's say, it's fair to say, just some of the eigenstates and eigenvectors of the Lubilian, that is, of the Markov chain propagator. And uh, in the summer last year, with uh, two of my PhD students, Mar Katya and Marco, and Mathieu, who is a postdoc, uh, we we've been able to come up with uh, sort of exact matrix ansatz for dynamics of this model, so without the boundaries. So this is for an infinite model, for an infinite system. There is a way, basically, to, to consider dynamics of observables thinking this in terms of, formulating this in terms of uh, abelian sister algebra, and you can write matrix ansatz, time-dependent matrix ansatz, which describes exactly these dynamics. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And again, you can do physical calculations from this. For example, you can compute dynamical correlation functions of local observers exactly at all times. Uh, you can solve inhomogeneous quench problem, that is, you join two infinite uh, thermalized subchains, and you let them, let them go. And then you can solve for the profiles of, of, of the density and, and of the currents as a function of time. And uh, most recently, uh, that was just a few weeks ago, uh, we put out a paper in collaboration with Juan, Juan P. Garahan uh, 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 on exact solutions of the large deviation problem. So again, uh, we can solve large deviation. And we can find, for, like, for example, explicitly, analytically, uh, functional, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, let's say, cumulant generating function for the large class of observables, which I will 
to discuss at the end of my talk. So again, as I say, I mean, this is a model, and that's the main advertising uh, point is that this model that essentially we can, you know, whatever problem you have, you, if you work for a few months, you will get a solution. That's kind of rewarding, right? I mean, uh, that's for a theoretical physics, it's something that <laughs> you like. OK, so like, what's the model? So it's uh, this rule 54. So it's basically uh, written in terms of a, 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 a kind of a leapfrog rule. I mean, uh, time now, in my talk, time goes downwards. Yeah? So time is vertical, and time goes top down. It's a bit unconventional, but that's basically where we follow the original proposal of the model. So we, we decided that this is this. So this is the, the middle cell in new time, and this is the, old, the, 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 the neighboring cells in, pre in, in current time, and this is the middle cell in the previous time. So this model is a two-level, uh, you know, it's a second-order uh, automaton, second order in time, which means that what happens next depends on two subsequent layers. Yeah? So it has to model Hamiltonian dynamics. That's why it has to be two or second order in time, like Newton's equations. Yeah? And since it's, 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 it is discrete in time and space, so it's defined on this diamond-shaped like, lattice. Yeah? So lattice is, 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 is this. Yeah? So this is the, uh, right, so basically you define, uh, based on these three cells, you could define new cell, which we call S2 prime. Yeah? And this S2 prime is a function of S1, S2, S3. So the, 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 the west, the east, and the, and the north. Yeah? And this function is a is nonlinear function, so it's basically like uh, sum of these three cells. And if there was just this, this would be like a simple simplest leapfrog rule for the wave equation in one plus one d. So it's a discrete d'Alembertian if you want, because it's z two. No? Everything is z two, so it doesn't matter whether I plus or minus plus or minus here, right? So that's the way you would just m encode uh, solution of the wave equation. But now you need nonlinearity, you need interaction. And the simplest interaction, which is symmetric with respect to space reflections and time reversal, is just this one. It's just the product. It's just a, it's a simple function of z2 function, right, of, 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 of the variables, right? And so that corresponds to code 54 because, you know, you can classify all possible rules by just having all possible 256 states of these three cells. And this gives us, you know, this, this, these three combinations give to 0. This is 0. This 3 goes to 1. This is 1. This goes to 1. This goes to 0. One and so on, and these are uh, kind of naturally ordered combinations of three bits. So this gives you 54. Yeah, that's why it's called 54. And then you can class it, I mean, you can check that all other rules are essentially uninteresting in this context. Okay, so that's what you get. For example, if you just take some initial condition, initial condition now is along the saw, yeah? and then uh, you know what you get is basically a bunch of movers, which you can think of as solitons, and then when two movers meet. They basically uh, absorb, I mean, kind of annihilate, and then they re-emit after one time step. So it's like an interaction with a phase shift or, or a time lag, which is one step. Yeah? So you can also think of this as a kind of a hardcore gas, hard, uh, how is it called? This uh, hard rod gas, yeah? uh, but with negative, uh, negative length. Yeah? Because when you have a hard rod gas, basically you collide, with, you make a negative. With respect to this, you make a negative shift. So it's a kind of a interacting. Uh, uh, attractive uh, hard rod gas, if you want. But it's not, I mean, it's hard rod gas in the sense that everything is discrete. So the particles can all have velocities plus or minus one. <coughs> okay, so now just to motivate you that this can be kind of amusing game to play further, I mean, I will not say anything on the analytical because we don't have any analytical solutions for these other models, but you could th also think of generalizing to, let's say, to multi species models. For example, this is just now here cells are just zeros and ones, but suppose that they are zero, one, and two. And you plot, plot uh, two in red, one in red, and two in blue, for example. And then there are essentially just two rules which make sense, uh, such that, that they have particle excitations, and that they have interesting scatterings. And uh, one of these rules seems to be integrable. And I have no time to motivate this why I think so, but uh, I can, I'm happy to discuss with anyone uh, later. But for example, this is uh, basically what happens with this two, uh, two color version. For example, now they have basically a different kind of scatterings. For example, when blue meets, uh, red meets blue, basically they just go across. Yeah? It's like non-interacting. But when, when red, uh, red means red, then they experience the same sort of collision as, as rule 54. So this would be like a classical model, let's say, for fermions. Because you know, when, they have, when they are in different spin states, then they just don't, uh, you know, they don't exclude. But then when they are in the same state, they exclude. So they, they have to. Yeah. So I mean, <coughs> and you know why we are doing this? I mean, okay, we want to have some other types of transport apart from diffusive. So I'm, I, I say it immediately because later I will probably have no time. 
But for example, I mean, you will see that for this Rule 54, we can show diffusive transport, but we can also find other types of transports in 1D lattices. For example, in this permipasta Ulam lattices, people find this KPZ-like transport. So the idea is maybe in this very simple cell automata, you also have other types of transport. And this is just a work in progress, but we are looking now for transport types in this model, and we find a class of observables for which we find t to the 2 thirds scalings and KPZ-like uh, 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 densities. Yeah? <coughs> So I guess it's just you know, to advocate uh, a bit that this can, can be an interesting game. So this would be low density, which is uh, still a bit boring. Then the medium density, you see that it's still something, already something interesting appears. For example, there are some sort of bound states of, 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 of uh, red and blue, which seems to stick together. And then they scatter as kind of collective excitations. For example, if you have even higher density, you see these I mean, this, 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 this strips, which basically, um, I mean, <coughs> It's still not clear, I mean, not, uh, not to me, that uh, wha wha how this would be really uh, used, uh, this picture. I mean, this is just a cartoon picture. But uh, uh, for example, we have looked at uh, conserved quantities in this model, and it seems that there is a number of conserved quantities which are suggest integrability. So uh, it's still, uh, I mean, that's the sort of the, the, the end of my talk, essentially, because that's what we want to do next. But let me now, now go slow by slowly to the, to the menu that I want to cover. <coughs> So again, I mean, what we no now want to do first is to define a Markov chain uh, 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 corresponding to this uh, interacting uh, reversible deterministic dynamics. Yeah? So uh, we are trying to, to marry two concepts of reversible dynam of, of deterministic dynamics, where by the ideas of Markov chains is usually not so, not so uh, uh, used. And then, uh, you know, but why do we want Markov chain? Because we want to marry these with stochastic boundaries. Yeah? So basically, we want to define, uh, instead of uh, a discrete rule, we want to define a, a kind of a generator, uh, a kind of flow k, if you want, because this is discrete in time. But it's a, it's a Markov chain, so it's a power t, uh, which acts on probability state distribution. So this p is a 2 to the n. Now, little n will be the system size for me. So this is now the, uh, the, the, the so, which defines the initial state. So initial state is a co configuration of classical uh, cell variables, if you want classical spins, zeros and ones along this, 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 this snake. And now the rule can be used to basically determine the cell here, 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 and so on. Yeah. The problem, of course, is the boundaries. And you will see that in the, in the boundaries, we have to prescribe some Markov chain yeah, to make this consistent. <coughs> so basically, what we do is essentially uh, something like this. So now the blue is the old uh, state of the co old configuration of, uh, let's say, the, the initial configuration, and the red is the new configuration. So then we divi divide this time time step into, into, into two, two layers. The first one we call u even, and then the second we call u odd. u even because we first set the cells at uh, even places, that is at place two, by using this rule 54 here, then uh, place four, and then this one. But then here we are stuck because we don't know what is here. So we have to use some sort of Markov chain which depends on these two states, these two cells. Yeah? So here we have to inject information into the, into the system. We exchange the, 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 the particles. Uh, which, yeah, par particles can hop in, or if you want excitations or solitons, can hop in and hop out from the model. So we have to you know, prescribe some rates, uh, injection absorption rates from the right boundary. And similar for the, for the next la layer, right, the, for the odd layer where, where we get stuck on the left. So we have to prescribe some Markov chain, which we call P left, and then the rest follows deterministically. So it's kind of a minimal stochastic model where stochasticity, stochasticity is only, you know, it's only stochastic boundary conditions, but the model in the bulk is, is, is deterministic. So that's basically how you, fact, uh, how you would factorize your Markov, uh, Markov matrix. Yeah? Basically, it's a product of uh, a matrices which are act on three sides, which encode rule 54, which are pure permutations. Since the deterministic dynamics is basically, you know, factor is basically Markov chain for the deterministic dynamics is a permutation matrix, yeah, because at each row it's essentially one element which is non-zero, which is the state, well, which we, uh, and the, the the column value, uh, when the column where it is one, it determines the new state. And so these are these uh, three side uh, permutation matrices which determine the and uh, determine the. I will explain later what uh, what they are. Uh, we determine the, the bulk cells, and then there is this, this guy in the boundary, which is a basically a 4 by 4 matrix. So the number, this, this indices determine the, st the cells. This is a standard tensor product picture. So the, 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 the state space is a tensor product of 2 to the n dimensional space. And this, this index determines which tensor factor in the, in the space it, 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 it acts upon. So, <coughs> okay, so that's basically, I think, very, very clear. So now this would be this uh, matrix, 8 by 8 matrix, which encodes rule 54. 
it's an A by 8. And then <coughs> it turns out, and that is, that is a lot of guesswork to find this. I mean, that's just uh, we are still not able to formalize this, even though we have been recently able to convince ourselves that this is what is essentially the, the, the complete set of integrable boundaries. Uh, but uh, you know, there is no, and I have to warn you uh, beforehand, we don't see any kind of uh, Young-Baxter formulation of integrability of this model yet. So uh, we are not able to even not, not, neither the reflection equation that, uh, uh, formulation of the integrable boundaries. So we are not able to to state something you know group theoretically very clearly. But uh, by just brute force investigations, we have convinced ourselves that. Uh, upon, I mean, uh, among all the the the, the, the two-state boundary, the, the two-cell boundary conditions, these are the only ones. This is one of the two classes of the only two classes which is in the group. Okay, so there are two four parameters. There is alpha, beta, and gamma, delta, and these are basically, you know, very vaguely speaking, related to the injection and absorption rates of the solitons from the left and from the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Uh, I will have a cancellation mechanism, which I will show you, which replaces to me Young-Baxter. Yeah, it, it is three-site, not two-site. In some sense, it's simpler. In some the other sense, it's a bit more involved. But you know, uh, even though struggling uh, for a while, I mean, to reformulate these other proper Young-Baxter conditions, we are unable to. So uh, I'm very you know, eager to hear any suggestions how one should do it. But at the moment, we are still kind of not there. But it, but you see, I mean, this, this type of cancellation mechanism will be quite generalizable. So I hope to be able to, to tell you at the end how one do, does large deviations, for example, to that. It's a kind of, OK, I don't want to, to go too fast to that. But OK, so that, that's just a kind of a Monte Carlo snapshot of the, uh, 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 so then again, times go down, of, of uh, um, trajectory of this model, uh, which is deterministic in the bulk, but then there is stochasticity in the boundary. So these blue and red cells are the cells which are switched on by the left boundary and cells which are switched on by the right boundary. Right? So here we basically engineered this uh, trajectory such that the right-hand side is hotter than the left-hand side. So you should see from the eye that there is a net flow of movers from the right to left. Yeah? So there, there will be a current. So the first question is, can we compute the steady state current and can we connect it to the bias of the uh, bias in the boundaries. Yeah. So there's, there should be some sort of fixed law. And the uh, question, I mean, can we, can we derive it? Yeah. And uh, OK, the, but the first, the, 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 the zero for the question is to establish ergodicity of this model. It's not so clear as, as for example, ergodicity in models like, like, like ASEP, where you have stochasticity in the bulk. So here, here basically, uh, you have only, you know, you have only uh, a, a branching, let's say, in this Markov, Markov graph uh, for the processes uh, on the boundaries, right? So basically, this uh, uh, propagator is a matrix which has exactly four elements in each row. And these four elements correspond to alpha, beta, gamma, delta. I mean, this, there, there is a one branching in the left boundary where left boundary has to decide whether it will put in or not put in the soliton or absorb it. Uh, expect, I mean, depending on whether there is already uh, site occupied or not, and the same on the right boundary. So, so there is this, uh, yeah, this, 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 this uh, coordination number four, which is uh, constant, independent on the system size. And uh, there is a sort of a very simple theorem to prove, which establishes the ergodicity of this model and says that this model is ergodic. Uh, namely, this matrix is, is I mean, is this, in this Veron Frobenius theory, it should be called irreducible and aperiodic. You should prove these two facts. Uh, and you can do that provided these parameters are in this open, open, open hypercube between 0 and 1. So all these parameters have to be non-zero, and then you're done. And it's very easy to show. Uh, I, I'd like to spend one slide to show that. OK, so uh, yeah, so that, that, would, that would mean, again, uh, uh, just interpreting in, re reinterpreting this theorem, it would mean that there is a unique steady state, and that any initial condition, any probability density from any initial, con any initial ensemble, it, if you want, it, f it flows exponentially fast to this uh, fixed point. <coughs> so what is the idea? I mean, if you look at uh, what one has to show in order to show that, is basically the idea is that <coughs> to show that uh, for any pair of uh, configurations, f and s prime, there is an integer, t0, such that for integers larger than t0, uh, all these matrix elements are, are, are strictly positive. So there is a connection in Markov, Markov graph. There is a connection which connects for, lar for a sufficiently large time any two, any two configurations. And how to show that? I mean, and this, this proof actually applies to a much larger family of models, which are deterministic in the bulk and stochastic in the boundaries. 
That's why I still want to spend two minutes to, 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 to illustrate this, uh, this picture. I mean, this picture is super simple proof of this theorem and basically connects this configuration to this configuration. So let's start from this. So first uh, proposal is the following. I mean, first I want to show you how to select boundary conditions, how to select this. One has to decide for which process on the boundary one, has ta uh, one takes. One has to select boundary conditions such that this, this state is annihilated. Yeah? So it goes to a zero configuration. And this I do by so-called absorbing boundaries. I can say for each mover when it goes to the boundary, I can decide uh, that I absorb it. Yeah? So I basically uh, reduce number of, uh, since, and since these guys cannot get stuck, they move. They will eventually always come to the boundary and they get absorbed. So there is a finite time, and this finite time is proportional to the system size, by which I can show that there is, will be uh, an empty universe. And then I have to just show that from empty universe, I can recreate any state. But this I just do by applying time reversal. I start from this any state which I want to reach. I apply anti-absorbing boundaries, and I connect it to empty state. Yeah. So that's basically the idea of this very simple proof of ergodicity. So this model is kind of <coughs> ergodic Markov chain. OK. <coughs> but now the question is how to, uh, how, to, how to, for example, write a steady state uh, probability density, or how to write even uh, decay modes. But since I have only finite no finite amount of time, I don't want to go into the, let's say, the idea which we proposed in the first paper by Carlos, with Carlos, uh, <coughs> because there we basically devised a concept which we call a patch state, which is a kind of a matrix ansatz, but it's, 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 it's really commutative. Uh, and I, since we now have this formulation, which is kind of more, even though I would say that this other formulation still can be useful for something, I mean, I would prefer now to just illustrate uh, all the solutions with this, uh, let's say, more compact formulation uh, from this paper. And uh, here I also touched uh, on the question that Kiron asked. I mean, this is basically, I mean, this, this formulation gives us now the simplest cancellation mechanism that we have for this model, and which uh, still I, I cannot uh, interpret this as a, as a sort of a zero curvature or, or Lux or young bastard condition. But, but it's, <coughs> it's something which is a sufficient, uh, uh, I mean, has a similar utility. So okay, now let's just let's just you know define some certain matrices which have certain properties, and then I will show you how this can be used. So there are four by four matrices, <coughs> which I call W zero and W one, and this zero and one corresponds to two states of the physical spin. So this will be like you know like like uh, matrices which I will put into my matrix product, and then I will define a vector of these two matrices, both W. And then I will also define the, the, the tilde matrices uh, where, where they are the same as these Ws, but uh, with a switch, switch of the two parameters. Yeah? So there are two parameters, two complex parameters, formally complex, for, if you want formal parameters, psi and omega, which play the role of spectral variables. <coughs> so then this, this, this matrix is satisfies some remarkable ident identity. <coughs> so as you see, a local rule was a three-site rule. I mean, this was a, you know, this automaton, the, the next state of the cell dep depends on three states, yeah? So, uh, I mean, one might not hope for, for two-side cancellation, but one needs three-side cancellation, yeah? So now take these three matrices. Now this is a tensor product notation. So this means that, and this is in components so that you can convince yourself you understand the tensor product notation, right? This is on, on three adjacent sides. And these are these tensor products of three vectors. Or you can think of uh, uh, just components, S, S prime, and S double prime. And this is the chi function, which encodes over 54. So this is basically the action of this matrix P1 to 3. It's the, it's the, it's the, the guy which scrambles the, the, the center cell based conditioned on the cells at the boundaries. Okay. So this, this, that's important. I mean, this, this P, which I, which, I wrote, uh, which I wrote there, I mean, this, this P is a matrix which uh, changes the cell uh, in the middle conditioned on the cells uh, 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 next to it, but doesn't change the cell next to it, which means that this matrix is commute if they are at least two sides apart. For example, P1, 2, 3 commutes with P3, 4, 4, 3, 4, 5, even though they share an index 3. But this 3 is only condition. It's a condition, if you want, it's a, it's a, it can be written as a kind of a Toffoli gate. I mean, it's a, um, <coughs> yeah. <coughs> okay, so, and then the, there is this some sort of delimiter matrix, which is just uh, this guy, which is a product of identity and sigma x. You want? <coughs> Okay, so now, I mean, this is, so this is just an identity which you can check. <coughs> and my claim is that now this basically encodes the integrability of this problem. Yeah? We can now show how to construct steady state in terms of matrix ansatz involving these matrices at some values of parameters psi and omega. 
So, I mean, of course, on top of this bulk condition, this will be like a bulk cancellation. You need some boundary equations. And these boundary equations uh, are the following. So, uh, so then there is this p123, which comes from the left. <coughs> and then there should be a, a four component vector, uh, actually, a pair of four component vectors, because it also depends explicitly on the physical coordinate one, so on the physical spin at side one. So, this is again tensor product notation. So, this is like S, S prime, S double prime. Through, through three states of cells. So this is like eight equations. Yeah? This is like four equations, eight equations, four equations. So suppose that there is these two identities, so that basically by applying p123 on the left, you create this defect. And then you use the bulk to carry this defect around. And then this defect can get absorbed on the right, or, either way, or the other way around. I mean, on the right, you create defect, you carry it on the left, and then it gets absorbed. And then the same for the, for the, for the other. Uh, well, there should be a dual set of equations like this. <coughs> and then suppose these bulk and boundary equations are valid. Then it's basically a few lines calculation to show that these two matrix products, <coughs> matrix product states, now this will be like P and P prime, sa satisfy this non, uh, steady state fixed point condition. But now since this is a second order equation in time, one has to follow two probability state vectors, which I call P and P prime which are separated by you know, square root of the dynamics. Yeah? I mean, it's like Qs and Ps in Hamiltonian dynamics. So you have to have two sets of variables. So you have to have probability state independently, uh, uh, depending on two sets of variables. And yeah, OK, so now, <coughs> sorry. So now basically what you do is basically you, 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 you use these bulk relations, which I wrote before, <coughs> uh, to observe that this uh, uh, S, which I call the limiter operator, the limiter matrix, can be carried by two, two, spa two, 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 two places to the right or two places on the left. And this is, yeah, this should not be both. This should be just S. <coughs> and then, of course, when this guy hits the boundaries, you use one of the boundary equations to basically, so just ba ma make a cyclic shift. And then at the end, end of the day, you prove that, you know, you, you prove that uh, one of these identities and the other, and you prove that this is a steady state. Now, there is a formal parameter, which I call lambda which you might put into equations, which cancels. But that formal parameter is important because it will carry the role of, of, of eigenvalue when you want to generalize this. So it turns out, I mean, this is kind of nice because it can be used not only for the steady state, but also for the eigenvectors. So with these same ansatz, I mean, I will not, since my time is limited, I will only, I only am showing, do, showing you how to do it for the steady state, but I will just uh, spit it out quickly for the eigenvectors, like uh, higher uh, excited states, let's say. But the, the mechanism is exactly the same. I will, I will come to that. I don't have the full spectrum. I have a conjecture about the full spectrum. <coughs> OK, so now I'm not yet completely done. So basically what you do now is you, you uh, how to compute. Now, now you have to get the secular equation, which gives me the, the values of psi and omega right, for the steady state. I mean, I, I, I have shown you now that this is a steady state, but I have not specified what is the value of formal parameters. These have to be connected to alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So but that, this I do simply by studying, let's say, scattering on the left boundary and scattering on the right boundary by the boundary equations. And I get two separate identities for the sine omega, which are independent, look independent, but one depends only on alpha beta, because this is scattering on the left boundary. The other depends on gamma delta, which is scattering on the right boundary. You identify these two and get two equations for, two, for, 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 for one variable, actually, for lambda, which is overdetermined, but still it turns out that it's a unique solution. This is lambda. You plug the lambda back to this or this, and you get explicit expression for the sine omega. So this is now a complete solution of the steady state vector. From this, you can compute, let's say, observables. You can find correlation functions and all that. <coughs> you can compute the current if you want, the spin current, uh, particle current. Uh, you find some sort of fixed law, and uh, I don't want to go into that, but that's, everything is done. So now, next question. I mean, can you diagonalize this uh, operator with a similar ansatz? <coughs> and yes, the answer is yes, but we have to just slightly modify the ansatz. So we have to introduce a single additional degree of freedom. Uh, that is, we have to go from four to eight-dimensional uh, auxiliary space, uh, <coughs> and so we introduce variables which depend explicitly on the on the position. This position for me is denoted by variable x, and uh, and I define a new variable, uh, uh, a new let's say spectral variable, which I call momentum, which I denote by z, which is a kind of mul multiplicative momentum. So everything is now a linear combination of uh, constant z to the x and z to the minus x where z is a momentum variable. 
for example, I define now this new W, which depend explicitly on the position. And now this is like a tensor product in the new Anzilla, which is two by two, and the old Anzilla, which is four. Yeah? So this is a dimensional matrix. Yeah? It turns out this is block diagonal. So it has, it's block triangular. So it has this block, which is W on the uh, left upper corner. And again, another W on the lower right corner, where these uh, formal uh, spectral variables are either scaled with uh, momentum like this or the inverse. Yeah. So there is, this, there is this strange scaling such that the product of two is conserved of the spectral variables. And then <coughs> there is this E12. So that is the, the thing in the, in the triangular block, which has some new matrices uh, depending as linear functions, linear combinations of Z to the X and Z to the minus X. OK, so that's, <coughs> of course, I don't have time to motivate further why. We, I mean, it's basically, I mean, <coughs> The derivation of this type of solution was a b quite brutal, so I, I cannot give you a really good motivation why, why we came up with this, uh, with this ansatz. But uh, it turns out it works. And uh, <coughs> so then basically, you again, apply this to this uh, cancellation mechanism. And then you get, uh, 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 basically, now you have two, two uh, eigenvalue variables, lambda left and lambda right. And the total eigenvalue is the product of the two. And now, basically, what you get at, at the end is the three, three set of couple equations for lambda left, lambda right, and the momentum variable z. So it's, and this is like a better, it's like a better equation, but for a single, basically for a single quasi-particle with a single momentum. So you would say, okay, this is like a non-interacting problem, but not quite, because, for example, now this is the spectrum. This is the spectrum. This is eigenvalue one, and the spectrum organizes in this daisy pattern. And what I'm showing you now is the beta equations, which gives you these red bullets, these red points, which we call a leading orbital. So now we have a kind of a shell model for the spectrum. And the first orbital is really like a single quasi-particle, right? So this one is like a non-interacting quasi-particle. Actually, it's this one and this one. So the red is giving you the inner and outer. And then this blue is the kind of a spectral curve you get in the thermodynamic limit. So it's a, it has this interesting cusp here. OK, so <coughs> but this is, this is only for the so-called first orbital for a single quadratic particle. Now, this is a, for a system of size 12. So that should be 4,000 eigenvalues. But even your eye would tell you that this is not 4,000 eigenvalues. This is like a uh, few hundred, maybe one or 200 eigenvalues. So obviously, there has to, has to be huge de degeneracy, right? So it, indeed, it, turned, it happens that you know, the red guys, the guys for the leading orbital are non-degenerate, but the guys inside become exponentially degenerate. So this one is twice. This one is four times and so on. The degeneracy number uh, grows exponentially with the order of the orbital. So the eigenvectors have to become a strange, you know, algebraic whatever uh, structures. I mean, which we, are not, we have no idea how to attack that, right? But, uh, but fortunately or unfortunately, we have been able to guess the spectrum exactly. So we just, it just happens that Beristar was playing with, with these equations a bit. And then he just introduced an extra variable, p, which is the orbital number. And then when p is equal to 1, we get this spectrum, which we can calculate analytically for the first orbital. But for p1, 2, 3, 4, we actually reproduce all these guys. <coughs> so which means that there is a kind of, again, a single kind of a super bunching of these uh, uh, quasi-particles to produce degeneracy. But still, there is a single momentum variable. Yeah? So it's a funny, uh, funny structure, right? I mean, <coughs> OK, so let me now. If there's some question on this, maybe otherwise I, now I change gears again. <coughs> OK, so now let me just go quickly to the, uh, to the third problem, or second, eventually. Can one compute uh, time dependence of observables exactly? So observables as uh, functions of, 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 of config over configurations. Yeah? <coughs> of course, I mean, configurations can be updated uh, deterministically. But you know, the question is, what do we mean by exact solution? Um, Questions: Can you encode it by some algebraic structure which has basically zero computational complexity? And this question can be ni more nicely uh, phrased in terms of observables. So let's say an algebra of observables. So let's try to do that. <coughs> so let's, let's now just define a, 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 a lo local basis, which is a function 0 and function 1 at position x. So this is something that you define. And you should define it as a, you know, this is an infinite system. But the local observable only concerns uh, a spin, classical spin, at side x. It doesn't care about what is, what's left or right from x. Yeah? And it is a delta which is uh, 1 if uh, s is alpha or 0 if s is not alpha. Yeah? 
So that, that would be all the clubs are over zero, and then uh, or, or one, yeah. And then you take a, you know you you define this as a as a as a generating set, and then you define the full algebra simply by multiplication rule. Yeah? So these are like functions. This is like algebra of classical functions over configurations. Yeah. <coughs> And then you define local observable, arbitrary local observable, still strictly, strictly local, that is uh, for, R, uh, for a cluster of R classical states, uh, a center around X, and which means it doesn't care of anything which is in the complement of this set, but here it has to check that at, at place X minus integer part of R over 2 is, is alpha 1, and the next place is alpha 2, and so on to alpha R. <coughs> so now, now we have the full uh, local algebra. And for example, you can always think of uh, a kind of uh, decomposition rule, uh, which just adds identity. Identity is simply unit element. It can be written as 0 plus 1 for any x. Right? So you can add identity on the left and on the right, and you can expand the support uh, of anything right, by just adding, uh, adding z uh, 0 or 1 on the left and on the right. right? So there you have a linear combination of, of four functions. Yeah? Any local function is a linear combination of four functions. Which, are, which is slightly less local. I mean, that doesn't seem to be very relevant at the moment, but let's see. Uh, OK, so then <coughs> another thing you have to define is the uh, notion of states. States will be like uh, linear mm -hmm. functionals on this uh, set of observables. So for example, it's a, it's a prescription which gives you a number out of the observable. And let's define, I mean, I will only consider s uh, separable states, states which are, can be written in terms of a product of numbers which only depend on local states, uh, local values. And this you can think of as probability distribution, let's say probability that cell is 1 or 0. Yeah. <coughs> but this probability distribution can depend explicitly on x. For example, you have, you have two states I will consider. is the maximum entropy state, where bo both of these two uh, probabilities are equal to 1 half, or an inhomogeneous initial state, for example, when these two probabilities are either or equal, or 1 is, for example, this will be like an extreme situation in which you will merge an infinite temperature state or in maximum entropy state with an empty state where everything is empty. So that might seem totally boring, but it turns out that already this gives you some quite interesting physics. So it will be like expansion into vacuum, expansion of a highest density plasma, if you want, into vacuum. The question is what happens to the edge of this? Yeah. <coughs> OK, so this is the two types of states which we, can, which we will be calculating. <coughs> So now, and the most interesting concept now is to define a time evolution or time automorphism in this uh, space of uh, observables. So uh, you define a dynamics of observable A like this. <coughs> and then you can split this dynamics again into, uh, and now you can write these dynamics in terms of tensor products of matrices, of 8 by 8 matrices, if you want. For example, you define an 8 by 8 matrix, uh, which is still, I mean, written in some sort of tensor product sense, so that it depends, it acts only on sides x, x minus 1, and x plus 1. So when y is centered at x, <coughs> when this cluster is centered at x, then it applies this simple uh, rule 54 rule. Otherwise, it does nothing. Yeah? And then you can split the dynamics into, again, string of products, I mean, again, into this u even and u odd. Yeah? This is u even times u odd, depending on whether time is uh, 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 even or odd. So it's like this checkerboard structure. I mean, at, at even times, there is u even. At odd times, it's, it's u odd. So my, ta my time, time unit now is 2. In this, in this particular part of the talk, my time unit is 2. I'm sorry, maybe I'm not totally consistent through the talk. OK. <coughs> and now, I mean, just uh, flash through this uh, statement. I will not uh, prove it, but uh, I will tr again try to illustrate it. So the statement is the following. Now, basically, what you have to do, due to the essentially homomorphism property of the time evolution, the only thing you have to do to know everything is to compute uh, time evolution of one excitation. So now this is uh, observable one, which means you don't care about everything else. But you, you take an infinite temperature state, for example, and you condition this on having one in the center. And then you want to know what happens. Yeah? And the statement is that what happens is a matrix product, which at time t only affects cluster of spins uh, uh, of 2t plus one size, because the rule is local. And these coefficients in front is a matrix product. It's actually a sum of two matrix products. With matrices which are have, have this, again have this staggering structure, W, V, W, V, W, V. Before I wrote V, V prime, W, W prime, now I write V, W, V, because it's not exactly the same thing. 
And, uh, <coughs> and then there is a segment guy. So there are two guys. Actually, this corresponds to left movers, and components of left movers and right movers. Uh, <coughs> so there are two guys like this. And then there is boundary vectors, yeah, which might explicitly depend on time. So here, the uh, left boundary vector de depends explicitly on time. Here, the right boundary vector ex depends explicitly on time. And now I will not, I, I, I will not, I mean, I will show you just, but I will not expect you to, to, to digest anything from just from this, uh, how, to, how to express these double uh, operators explicitly. But the, I just want to, to tell you that, you know, now, you, you, of course, you can't work with 4 by 4 matrices. I mean, you exp I don't know what you expect, but what we find is that the dimension of auxiliary, sp auxiliary space is infinite, and that the effective dimension grows as polynomial function of t, so which means that these w are some ladder operators in two-dimensional auxiliary space. And now in two dimension in the sense that it is a hopping operator in two, di two, di two dimensions. So it's a lattice in 2D. It's auxiliary lattice in 2D. And this guy is somewhere in near the origin of the lattice. And then you grow. So basically, the number of states you explore by t time t is of, of the order of t square. So the complexity is still polynomial, but it's, it's, it's t square. <coughs> and uh, forget about this. I mean, I just form. This is just in terms of this uh, projection and ladder operator. You can write them explicitly, but. This is not very illuminating. Also, the boundary states you can write, but again, it's a mess. But again, the physics, what is the physics? The physics is basically you have to determine a number which is either 0 or 1. So this coefficient, <coughs> I mean, this is very digital. Everything is very digital. You just have to determine whether this coefficient here is 0 or 1. It turns out that this, wait, for a deterministic problem, can only be 0 or 1. So you have to devise a computation scheme, which a matrix product computation scheme, which gives you a 0 or 1. Yeah. So the idea is basically to consider this pyramid and this is the initial, this is the configuration for which you want to determine whether this is 0 or 1. And then you can just, you just have to, 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 to uh, uh, then you have to uh, 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 figure out whether this can originate from an initial state which has a left mover on the top. If so, then this guy will be 1, otherwise 0. Or you can also check if this can be originated from the right mover on the top, then the second term would be 1 and the rest would be 0. And for that, there is a simple counting computational procedure. And that counting is encoded in these matrices. Yeah? So it is not so horrible at the end of the day. Of course, Katya, the main student who worked on that, he worked for, she worked for almost half a year on that. But at the end, I mean, it was a brute. But, but you know, once we realized how this can be pictured, it's basically still in, in quite intuitive. <coughs> OK, <coughs> and then the next sort of exercise is to how, well, the, the, most of these six months of work was actually on using this to compute the, the dynamical structure factor. Because that's, that's really, I mean, even when you have the matrix ansatz, it's still highly non-trivial. I mean, at least was for us, how to compute, for example, a dynamical correlation function. Now, take, for example, an infinite temperature state, just to be simple. Of course, you can use any equilibrium state here, any time invariant state. For example, the state that we used in the first part of the talk with two parameters, psi and omega, would also be time reverse, would also be invariant on the time, time shifts. So this, for this, we could also compute this. But, but just for simplicity, we computed this for, 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 for infinite temperature state. So what you have to do is this, uh, you know, this is, the this is a special temporal correlation function, right? Subtracting the connecting, connected part, which is just one quarter. <coughs> and then basically using matrix product, you have to essentially, det you define some sort of transfer matrices. And then you have to evaluate this. <coughs> and then, uh, I mean, just to tell you this can be done. And at the end of the day, you get explicit expression, explicit expression for the infinite temperature uh, spatial temporal correlation function, which is exactly written in terms of some binomial symbols. But in the large space-time limit, you can use Stirling formulas for this. And you get exactly the Gaussian profile with two peaks, one going to the left, one going to the right, with velocity one, one, one half. And they are spreading with the variance, which is going like root, root t. So uh, there is the fusion constant, which you can read off. I mean, this is basically a proof of diffusive transport. With, again, I mean, it's diffusive, but on top of some sort of convective uh, term which goes ballistically. Yeah? <coughs> OK, so now this is, uh, <coughs> this is one part. Uh, the second thing which one can calculate, or we have tried to calculate, is this uh, extremely inhomogeneous quench problem. So you, you connect the infinite temperature plasma to an empty lattice. And then what happens, this is just a Monte kind of a direct calculation of a particular initial condition. So what happens, you see, I mean, it's a kind of a right movers now basically go without being uh, disturbed from anything coming from the right. So basically, you can just uh, follow them. But what is interesting is that you know the property of this state basically determines some correlation properties of these right movers. So for example, if you look now at the, at the density 
in the structure as a function of x and t, starting from inhomogeneous state, you find that on the right you have some sort of uh, correlation pattern. You have some, you know, you have some 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 some, some crystalline behavior. So there is uh, 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 more probability that the gap between these two solitons is such and less that it is in between. Yeah. So there is, uh, I mean, <coughs> yeah, one, got, one gets this exact, and there is exponential fall off of that. So one, one gets exact expression in this free, free regime. We call this a free regime for this uh, uh, front, if you want. There is this correlation for, correlated front. And then uh, uh, there is this, well, here you don't see that, but if you do averaging over the uh, or possible infinite temperature states, then you get a kind of a smooth profile here, which uh, spreads again as a square root of t. So it moves again with constant speed, and uh, it has an error function profile, with, which means diffusion. <coughs> so it's again another kind of proof of diffusion in this model. Okay, so now uh, the last part, the last thing. Okay, so I guess I'm doing fine with time. So the last. Uh, uh, kind of exercise we tried to do with this model was the one in collaboration with uh, Huang Ping. Uh, <coughs> so we tried to calculate uh, sort of a large deviation theory for, let's say, extensive observables which are extensive in space and time. Uh, but actually in space, they are actually very, very general. So they cannot be, they not need, need not be extensive. They can be arbitrary homo inhomogeneous functions. So suppose you have inhomogeneous functions which you call fx and gx. And this basically determine, I mean, these are like, you know, two, some two-side observables, right? Which depend on, this is now a classical variable, uh, classical configuration variable at place x at time t. Now again, I'm sorry for that, but now my time goes again over integers and half integers. And half integers means after half a time step, and then there is a full time step, and then another half, and, full and so on. And so you can choose different observable to be measured at even and odd time steps, just to have a generality. <coughs> So basically what we do now, we basically show that the tilted Markov generator can be diagonalized, or can be, at least the leading eigenvector can be written in matrix product form. So what would be the tilted generator would be this product now. U odd times some G of S times U even times of F of S. And F and G are factorized. So I'm writing now this in, in, in multiplicative way. And now uh, this is diagonal. So this is a two-side of operators, which are diagonal, which means that, uh, yeah, they have this four guys here, and these four guys, I just use a convenient notation where this already inclu include this, 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 this uh, formal variable S, yeah, the counting grid, if you want. <coughs> and similar for G. So we introduce little fx, uh, little uh, f of x and little g of x yeah, in this way. So this is just encoding the observable, which I want to do full, full counting with. <coughs> so, and now, Again, it, ha it so happens that one can now satisfy this type of cancellation mechanism. So for arbitrary functions, f, now I'm sorry, now I'm using j, not x anymore for position variable. Um, I will just, for some reason, use slightly different notation in the last paper. And it depends, of course, on the preference of the authors. But so, <coughs> so here, for example, uh, yeah, it's, it's the, the position j minus 1, j and j plus 1. So for any triple of sides, and for any uh, diagonal matrix, which is, which depends on four numbers, and this one depends on another four numbers, you can find matrices W, W, X, such that this X can be pulled through and resulting in another matrices, which I call V. And then you use the same va va matrices later and have another X, but now look, this X, now this, of course, I should stress, this is written for J assuming to be even. So G, J is assuming to be even, so here it's an odd side, and this J is an even side. I, I could have used another name. I'm sorry, but you know this could be x and y, for example. But the point is, there are two impurity operators now, and there are two sets of matrices that I call w's and v, which are fully inhomogeneous. And inhomogeneity of these matrices encodes fully this this observable field, this f and g. System is no, no, no. The system will have boundaries. So yeah, I'm sorry, uh, I forgot to say that. But I don't think this is very crucial, but for this calculation, the system has boundaries. But I'm now discussing the bulk cancellation, and I kind of think that this, you know, the boundaries are just like a perturbation, which, uh, I mean, as you will see, we will find some sort of phase transition, which means that the system will flow to, to active and inactive phases, which don't depend on boundary conditions at all. So uh, these boundaries are just seeds, which then, you know, 
OK. <coughs> no, but what I believe is quite interesting is that you, know, you have this inhomogeneous matrix, and, I mean, inhomogeneous cancellation. That is, for any Fs and Gs, there exist such matrices, which I'm not showing in my talk, uh, because they will be probably too much. But uh, it's a three by, they are actually 3 by 3. They, they, are, they, they can be written as 4 by 4, even what I, called before, what I wrote before as these 4 by 4 matrices. One can find uh, a slightly more optimal representation in which they are 3 by 3. Actually, they have all rank 3. These finite dimensional matrices all have rank 3, and also these guys have rank 3. And the matrix elements of these matrices can be written as a kind of a product over these Fs and Gs. So it's a kind of a cumulative, uh, multiplicative integrals, if you want. Uh, so which, you know, as input, you get Fs and Gs. You take Fs and Gs, and then you result in this solution of this cancellation mechanism. And then, <coughs> and then of course, you also want to ask boundary equations. Again, you find some sort of deformed or tilted boundary equations. Again, for arbitrary F1, F2, and uh, whatever. I mean, on the right, you have uh, Fn minus 1. And so on. OK, and then you know the point is that if this, for example, again, there is sort of a simple lemma you can check. If the bulk and boundary hold, then such MPA, which I write like this now, Ws for the P and Vs for the P prime, solves the tilted eigenvalue problem. Yeah. So and then uh, you can write, of course, this the eigenvalue as a logarithm. In terms of logarithm of this eigenvalue, you can write this uh, cumulant generating function theta of S. So now this becomes now a solution of some sec secular equation, which is third order algebraic equation. So this theta of s is simply a simple, if you want, you can write explicitly in terms of Cardano formula, a simple uh, root of third order polynomial with, co with coefficients, which are kind of complicated products of the, of the observable fields, of the fields which are determined the observable that you want to count. So I mean, it's super simple. No? I mean, it's technically complicated, but conceptually, it's very simple. <coughs> and this is what you find. So, uh, <coughs> so that would be the uh, this, this, this is these are let's say exact numerically exact results for finite system, and then we scale the system size to large n, and then we and now uh, I'm sorry again now, the system size is becoming large n here instead of little n as before, but anyway this is the system size, and then you get okay this is the cumulant, gener cumulant generating function, so its first derivative has this. Uh, this shape, which becomes a, a pure kink, which signals this uh, inactive active phase transition, right? So for negative uh, counting variable, you get this active phase, which means that for in thermodynamic limit, you get to this kind of a, I'm sorry, the resolution here is too low, but this should be like a regular pattern. So it, ge it gets a kind of a crystal in space time. And here it gets to an empty phase. Yeah. So what is observable? Observable is a magnetization. So it means that, yeah, a g is 0 and f is simply one as if, if one of the spins is one. Yeah. It's a one body observable. It's the simplest one. It, this, this, but the phenomenology of this transition doesn't depend on that. So as, as long as observable is extensive and space and time is the same. <coughs> yeah, now this is the, some other properties of this cumulant uh, generating function. <coughs> and then from that, as a Legendre uh, transform, you can get also large deviation functions, which in thermodynamic limit goes to a box. <coughs> OK, uh, so I, with this, I would maybe conclude. Uh, <coughs> so uh, the main sort of source for, of excitement for me about this model was that you know, we might have an integrable. Uh, well, integrable is, again, a strong word here, right? I mean, I'm not, I was not able to, to show integrability in any sense. I mean, integrability, which I can kind of show is that it is, should be understood in a sense of uh, being exactly solvable. So everything that we try to calculate at the end, we could calculate. So it should, should, have mean, it should have meant some sort of integrability, right? <coughs> uh, so you can calculate a, vari a variety of things that you might be interested in statistical mechanics. And uh, yeah, the main thing which I would like to understand next is, uh, uh, is there any link, proper link to young Baxter integrability? For example, uh, there are some generalizations of this model uh, which can be understood as stochastic or, in or unitary models. So for example, in this rule 54, there is some process which could be branched like uh, to a combination of two processes. So like the rope, with rate, you go to one, and with another rate, you go to another. Or in unitary dynamics, you have some, you know. There is not such a big difference as you probably mostly 
No, I mean, there is not such a big difference between stochastic and uh, quantum, right? Because it just amounts to, to complex rotation. But uh, deterministic seems to be fundamentally different, yeah? But it seems that this model allows for some uh, generalization, which is stochastic or unitary, and still seems to be integrable in the same sense. It has similar cancellation, but again, we are not able to. Uh, and anyway, this is all very preliminary, so I, I cannot be very coherent on that. And then, uh, okay, so then very recently some other people or groups have picked on that model. For example, uh, from a group of David Hughes and uh, Gopalakrishnan, uh, Devika and uh, Roman, I mean, they have uh, looked at uh, this very same model in relation to generalized hydrodynamics. Uh, even more recently, I forgot to add this, was a paper by Jerome Dubai and uh, Vincenzo Alba and Marco Medeniak who proposed uh, I mean, who use this model as a, as a model for operator spreading and operator entanglement. I mean, uh, one has to say, and I already stressed that, uh, mentioned that in the beginning, but I can say again, one can uh, uh, interpret this model also as a quantum cellular automaton. There is a quantum circuit formulation of that. And what I discussed could be understood as a diagonal, as a, as a dynamics on diagonal part of the anti-matrix. So that model is a kind of strange in the sense that dynamics of diagonal part of density matrix and of diagonal part are completely uncoupled. So you can think of it as a, you can think of it as a classical quantum model as you like. As you like. Okay, with this I would like to thank you for your attention. <coughs>well that's that's a tilted pro that's a tilted model right i mean that yeah. that is uh, uh, a calculation of diffusion i mean this is the let's say s equal to 0 is the basically is the is the physical, is the physical model. model yeah right yeah. but of course you can do this so called dupe transform right this uh, you can write an effective markov chain which is proper markov chain which corresponds to non zero value of s right and we have done that in that paper so basically that's the the way these diagrams were produced these are the results of proper monte carlo with proper markov chain but with this dupe transform. So that this is corresponding to, to non-zero value of counting field. And that this, this, this dynamics flows to this. I mean, and this one just evaporates. I mean, here particles just evaporate. Okay. Yeah. And here they just get stuck. They crystallize. So there are these two cases.